This grassland represents by far the most popular type of grass in the UK. Ryegrass, a bit of white clover, but we could be doing so much more. I'm Ian Wilkinson and uh, my business is Cotswold Seeds. Uh, we are uh, retailers of grasses, legumes and herbs and we put together seed mixtures for forage use uh, for farmers across the whole of the UK and we get to see as a result of that what people sow, why they sow it and, and of course hear back uh, the results, uh, good and bad. When I left Agricultural College, uh, which is nearly 30 years ago now, I found at that time, which was of course a time of very intensive agriculture, dependent largely on the use of nitrogen fertiliser, that we were seeing the vast majority of farmers growing ryegrass because it responded very well indeed to nitrogen fertiliser. What are you mixing here then, Rob? Okay. Well, we've got cosmolic, uh, dasas, rough stalk tomato grass, yep. um, a falcon, a tall fescue, yep. What's changed is the nitrogen price is very high. Also, protein sources are limited and quite expensive. And so the fact that legumes, in other words clovers, can provide free nitrogen, because they're nitrogen-fixing plants, fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil, and because they're rich in protein, they make very good forage plants for farmers. <laughs> One of the great challenges as a seed merchant is to be able to formulate different mixtures for different situations. When an individual farmer comes to us, the first thing we ask is, how much rain do you get? What sort of soil are you on? And how are you going to use this mix? Because if we know those basic things, we can formulate seed mixtures. We can get significantly better results when we put the right crop on the right land. What we have is a bit of a movable feast, but one that can provide very good forage, wholesome diet, without much input, so farmers can be much more self-sufficient. As is the case with Manor Farm near Chedworth. Manor Farm Chedworth is a typical Cotswold Farm. It's got light, stony soil and it's on top of the hills. And this particular field has had a complex seed mixture in it for the last three years or so. Time for breakfast. Yep. <laughs> And they've got about half an acre here, yeah, then. Yeah, that's right. And that'll last them for how long? 24 hours. OK. And then they'll move forward and you back fence it as well? No. They yeah. know where the grass is. Yeah, yeah. Well, it looks really impressive. It's about the greenest yeah, ground in the Cotswolds. <laughs> thank you. And this is pretty stony stuff. I brought this out this yeah. morning because I thought we'd have a, a dig, but I'm yeah. not sure. A farm on rocky ground yeah, calls for certain types of seeds. Anyway. Right, so here's, here's a bit of ground that the cows had last week. Let's just see if we can dig up a bit. What is under there? Apart from a lot of stone, we've also got some roots. And it's these roots that make the difference to this crop. So this is a ryegrass. Here's a coxfoot. Here's a chicory. And this is a red clover big tap root on that. So if you're farming soil like this with lots of stones in it, then these deeper rooting plants are absolutely essential. Without them, frankly, there is no grass. This complex mix of species is even more obvious in the ungrazed paddocks. Tomorrow's feast. This is chicory. This is the most obvious one here because it's the tallest and it grows up very fast indeed. There's plenty of other plants in here too though. Look, we've got red clover for example here. We've got ribwort plantain, which is another herb like the chicory. Deep rooting plants, 
which really do very well in dry conditions. Now, this is interesting because the ryegrass look is running to seed. Now, we do put ryegrass in this mix, it does have a place, but like all plants, it has strengths and weaknesses. When it's dry, it droves to seed very quickly and the quality deteriorates. On the other hand, we've got leafy coxfoot here, which is showing no sign at all of going to seed and still remains very, very green and soft. There's plenty of other plants in here too, some more unusual ones perhaps. Here's some all site clover, which is a, a, a relatively short-lived perennial legume, a bit like the red clover, but grows later in the season. Um, I can see here some sand foin. Uh, this is a favourite on chalky soil. This is a plant that is, again, very deep rooting. There's your big mix of different species, which delivers tremendous benefits, not just in terms of forage, because we know it's a good forage mix, but also in terms of soil improvement. These deep rooting plants really do make a big difference to the soil. Also, it provides a tremendous environmental benefit. There's lots of insects here. You can hear them buzzing around us all the time. And it also provides pollen and extra all year round because what you've got here is a rotation going around a whole field situation, not just on margins, where because of the regrowth and the rotational grazing, we've got flowers literally going around this whole area all the time. But perhaps just as importantly, it's these guys behind us that find this mix of different species much more interesting than perhaps just having a single species to graze. It's a way of farming, a philosophy even, that's shared by an increasing number of farmers. My name is Ben Mead, I'm a dairy farmer and we farm just outside Ponsonuth, not far away from Falmouth in Cornwall. The high, input, high output system that I inherited was you know, definitely considered best practice 20 years ago. Come on, Gus, come on. It was an army of advisors who were saying, oh, will you do this, that and the other, but essentially we were shoveling large quantities of grain into animals um, to get you know, reasonably large quantities of milk back out of them. I really wasn't making much of a return on it, so we started asking the questions of who produces milk at the lowest cost. Inevitably, my answers kept going back to New Zealand. Come on, girls, come on. So we then moved very quickly to 100% grazing. Come on, you daft creature, come on. And then at the same time, we started introducing more seeds and more plant diversity. Here we've got a number of diversities. We've got some red clover here, which is actually feeding all the soil bacteria. There's gathering the sun and um, the soil bacteria are producing nitrogen for the soil so they're feeding the soil and all the soil microorganisms. We've got a bit of plantain here and that's again quite healthy. Um, I used to call it whey bread, the travellers used to be able to live on just this alone. Well it's actually quite tasty as well too, it's got a nice crisp crunch to it as well too. And there's all sorts of various rye grasses and weed grasses and things in here. And also, you'll notice that there's lots of different stem sizes, and these kind of act like flossing for the teeth of the animals as well. So there's actually quite important to keep all these long, stemmy, what looks like rubbish to most farmers. You know, that's how nature intended. They need to graze the stuff as it comes, not stuff that's been processed. I think there's quite a lesson there as well. What we found when we stopped using the fertilisers, we were finding increased quantities of weeds and things taking off. And I started actually looking at the, the mineral content of the weeds and actually what we found from the United States Department of Agriculture sources. And you start looking at the trace element content and actually all these weeds, or so-called weeds, are actually very, very rich. And it's not this sort of kind of woolly herbalist rubbish. They could actually look and analyse it in the laboratory. And in a lot of cases, there's actually more nutritional value than the best quality rye glasses and so on that people are growing. So now we kind of let the weeds proliferate to a certain extent. And it's quite interesting because if you actually don't start cutting them, you find that at certain times the animals tend to eat weeds at specific times of the year. And I'm sure that it ties in with nutritional requirements. rush out and spray things and spread fertilizers and chasing all that last drop of yield you have a lot more time to either watch telly or um, actually go out and walk around the farm and observe and see what's going on right the taste test sycamore 
want the ivy. No, you don't want ivy today. Let's, uh, <laughs> we've got, oh, there's a bit of holly in there as well too. They often quite like holly. Notice how they're all sniffing the leaves and so on through there. There's definitely a perusal of uh, What do we reckon? Two out of ten for the ivy. <laughs> ten out of ten for the sycamore. <laughs> and, uh, hmm. Holly is not so bad either. Now, the ivy they tend to eat in the winter, actually. When we started really observing what the cows were doing and, and watching them sniff all the different plants and hedgerows, I and mean, in Cornwall, you know, we're famed for our wonderful hedgerows and so on. And we fence totally differently now, so the cows can't destroy the hedgerows. Oh, God. <coughs> but they have this access to this huge, huge sort of um, chest of medicine, essentially. Right, well, if you can, if you want to get in the slow bushes and things, you can see where the cows have actually been chewing them off. You have to look quite carefully, but they've just been snipping and pruning everything off. You know, it's very natural farming. And then these are actually slows here. And you can see some of them, they're actually, um, I don't know if you've ever tried these, uh, they're absolutely... Oh, God. They're absolutely disgusting when they're, when they're not ripe, but they actually get quite sweet by October. I'm not sure whether the cows have actually been eating these or not. I mean, they certainly eat them when they're ripe. Well, I don't think they're making slow gin over in the corner of the field. And if they are, I really want them to, to let me know about it. But you can see they've really been nipping this off. They tend to eat what they need at the specific times of the year, so and quite often when it's ripe. And of course, some of these things are, can be toxic, but of course the toxicity is always in, actually in the dose, so it's a, a little of what you fancy and not too much. Often a lot of the antidotes to the toxins and so on are actually within the same hedgerow as well too. So there's a lot of that that's going on. But generally the cows seem to have a lot more knowledge than we do about what's safe to eat. Well, I think you have to give animals the opportunity to access self-medication and that's where our hedgerows come in. And you know, I've been to so many other farms where, where you can see the cows trying to self-medicate the hedgerows and things and there's a there's an electric fence that's got such a big shock in it. And these cats sort of dancing around thinking, shall I, shan't I? I need those nettles in the hedge. <laughs> I always hate being asked about whether I've got a healthy herd or not, because I always feel it's slightly tempting fate and so on. Um, we haven't really had a vet here now for about four or five years. See these bits down here? It's what the Americans call happy lines. <laughs> I love that, the idea that cows can have happy lines on them. And I think there are all sorts of things at play. I mean, our cattle walk considerably further than many cattle. They're on clean pastures at least every 12 hours. They eat a diet which they evolved over thousands of years to actually eat. Very much on a sort of meat and two potatoes. Well, <laughs> not meat and two potatoes, <laughs> to put a cut on that. <laughs> actually, they used to be on meat and two potatoes, <laughs> probably. But um, they're, they're on a very natural diet, which has a huge diversity in it, increasing diversity in it. Of course, the health benefits of a diverse diet reach much further than the cattle that graze it. Uh, we have tall fescue here. It tolerates stresses, drought conditions, winter, hard winter conditions. And next to it is meadow fescue. Meadow fescue is actually the closest. But these, so these, these are all individual uh, varieties. Of course, when a farmer is reseeding a, a field. Professor Nigel Scollan conducts research at the Institute of Biological, Environmental and Rural Sciences at Aberystwyth University. The most important benefits from species-rich pastures, these grasses uh, are very rich in important uh, nutrients to feed the animal and make the animal productive and to improve the health of the animal. Uh, but of course those grasses also will have improved nutritional characteristics which reflect through in the meat. So grasses, um, and we look at the grass around us in this lovely sward, is quite rich in fat. That fat contains very healthy fats, the omega-3 fatty acids, which will feed from the grass through into the animal and relay through to the meat, giving it a higher profile of useful fats in the meat. Healthier soils, healthier animals, healthier produce, all stemming from a greater diversity in pasture. One of the things that actually farming this way has taught me is that actually the insurance policy is diversity. 
And the more you farm increasingly in monocultures, the more at risk you actually put yourself. There isn't a one-size-fits-all. We've tried that approach with ryegrass. We can tailor mixtures of species to suit individual circumstances, and it makes such a big difference to the results. We just look at growing as much as we possibly can with as great a diversity as we possibly can as well too, because ultimately that feeds the whole ecosystem.